Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you these after, just so uh, you're not just, you, the head's not in it, my, my head will be in this, okay? So uh, we'll get straight to the point, we're running just a tad late, I do appreciate you guys all showing up, we ready to go, Ocon, we ready to go, Panda Man, Christian, everybody's here, appreciate your time. All right, so on the board right here, not on that screen, I have two different sentences. Okay, I'm going to be reverting back to these sentences. Um, they mean the same. They're just rephrased the different. All right, the first one says, the majority of my life I've fallen victim to my own circumstances. All right, the second one says, the perception of how I view the world creates my own circumstances. Cool, so they kind of mean the same thing. It's just the perception's different. And when the perception's different, the result is different. And not only the result, but the timely fashion that you can obtain that result. Like I said, we're going to go, we're going to dissect this. Uh, we don't have another marker, do we? It's all good. Don't even worry about it. So this is called the power of reframing. Sentence one to sentence two. All right. 90% of the world's population falls under number one. It's super simple to do that. I know I'm one of them, all right? Um, not as much as I used to be. Reframing takes practice, consistent practice. We are, our mind is not meant to always thrive. It's meant more than anything to just survive. That's just how the brain is works. It's for survival mode only and to, thank you, brother. And to thrive and survive is different, cool? So it's crazy, it's like, why? It's pretty simple though, if we think about it logically. As we age, and we're not, we're probably on the same wavelengths that as we age, responsibilities increase. Can we all agree on that? And as responsibilities increase, so does stress. And with stress comes what's called emotions. All right, so, here we are navigating through life, we're getting older, we have more responsibilities, we have more stress, and here comes emotions that attach along with it. Well, it's one thing to be able to handle, we'll say, our own emotions navigating through life, but then we have others. We have our significant other, if we have one, we have children, we have our co-workers, and even our friends. All those different emotions stem towards weight on the shoulders of yourself as you navigate through life. And it's easy to fall victim to different circumstances. Your energy starts to go down. It's called your central nervous system. You only have so much of it. It's not our fault. If we have a lot of responsibilities and a lot of stress, we need rest, but man, we don't have rest. It's a day-to-day -day operation that we have to do to be able to maintain just our life as it is, not to thrive. So what happens is our self-perception eventually starts lowering. I know for myself, with the weight of the world on your shoulders, it's not easy to have those same dreams and aspirations as you once did, let's say. All right, it's easy just to, I'm not going to say complacent, but it is easy to become complacent. I'm not saying we don't have fun, okay? We can still have fun with our life, but to get outside of our comfort zone, it's super simple to kind of stay in it because look what happens if 90% of the people roaming this earth are in this perception of life. It's a victim mentality, and it's like, well, what's this got to do with the price of eggs, man? This is a fasting seminar. Why are we talking about perceptions? Why are we talking about reframing? And it's like, okay, there's three different aspects to this. The first one is, we are the only species that eats because of our emotions. Do you see how I tied that in right there? So if we have the weight of the world on our shoulders, we have to handle our own emotions and the emotions of others, and we're the only species. That's not my rules. 
looked at up. We're the only species that eats because of our emotions. Think about you're happy, you want to eat. You're sad, you eat. How about you're bored? Do you eat when you're bored? Name an emotion, it's going to drive you towards some sort of caloric consumption. Not my rules. I'm one of them. I told you. I'm here. All right? Just as much as everybody else is. The difference is, is that I'm very aware of the perception difference. Of how to navigate into the reframing aspect. Number two, the quality of your thoughts are always going to determine the quality of your life. One more time, the quality of your thoughts are going to determine the quality of your life. And if we want change, number three, like, I'm going to say substantial change, not chasing the same 10 pounds, the same 15 pounds, the same peak and valleys that we go through, whether it's for fitness, whether it's for weight, whether it's just for life in general, you have to change your habits. We cool with that or am I outside the line here? I know I'm going to get loud at some points, but we have to change the habits. And if you've got to change your habits, you're going to have to change your actions, right? And all actions are influenced by your thoughts. So it's very important that we pull some layers back before we start talking about the X and O's of fasting. I can guarantee you Kyle can get you to drop some weight, like that. He's the best of the best. But what he's taught me first and foremost is that you will never outperform your own level of self-development. And that's what fasting is. It's a form of self-development. It's a form of controlling your emotions. Cool so far? I'm trying to break it down like 101 aspect of things. So... This was a sentence that I, that I actually wrote. I wrote an article about the time a Latin king pulled a snub nose on me. I was 14 years old. Right into my sternum. I wrote this not too long ago. And this is a low-frequency sentence. There's low-frequency words in there. Something like fallen, victim. That's low-frequency. Now look at this one, how I view the world creates, how I view, right? That's high frequency. So if you want change, there's going to be resistance. We know that, right? With any substantial change, just like if you're trying to get fit, if you're trying to grow your bicep, there has to be resistance on that bicep curl. And it's in the rest and the recovery that we get bigger, stronger, let's say more durable. But if you're like, hey, this hasn't grown, I don't see any definition right away, right? That's this low-level perception. That's the frequency. It won't happen. You have to be able to reframe how you view resistance. And it's going to come because you're going to be on this panda challenge. And it's going to be tough. And you're going to want to throw in the cards or the white flag. You're going to want to wave it at times. But you have to learn how to reframe the situation. Why is this good for you? I know this is all things that you know, okay? I'm just here to bring it out more to your attention because it's almost like there's signs everywhere. Just like when we drove past the Panda House and we're like, we are going there, <laughs> right? I'm not necessarily sure if I'm your sign, but I just wanna let you know how my brain works. Years and years of this is hard to try to just transition overnight. And if you don't keep practicing, because like I said, the brain wants to just survive. And just surviving is coming out of your cave, making sure no saber-toothed tigers out there, hurry up and grab your food or make a fire or whatever you need, and run back in the cave. It's not going out there and figuring life out. That's thriving. There's a big dis dif difference. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to this. The last thing that I remember, I had my daughter on my left-hand side and my soon-to-be wife on my right-hand side. I was struggling hard for like three days or like go to the hospital. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Boom. I wake up. I have tubes in my arm and electrical cords in my arm. I was frustrated. 
How could this happen? I was a victim. When I woke, I was a victim. How could this happen? I'm in shape. I was a victim of, of my own circumstance. That's a, poor me. Looking back, though, now, how I view the world and how it creates, it was only a matter of time before I was in the hospital. I was at the pinnacle of my financial or my entrepreneurial career. My finances were through the roof, but also was my stress. My sleep was down. My nutrition was off. Was I working out? Yeah, but I wasn't recovering right. Looking back, man, there's telltale signs everywhere. I was going through a lot of stuff, but I'm not the victim now, not in this story. If it could have happened, it happened on the recovery. They didn't know what I had. They thought I had meningitis. They poked me and prodded me, flipped me over, gave me a spinal tap. If anybody's had a spinal tap, man, that's a bastard. You feel very violated, right? There was spinal leakage. It, it, the recovery was hard. Does anybody have like a spiritual friend? Do anybody? You know how you have like friends like, hey, help move my living room for me. You want to work out. And then there's that spiritual friend. Anybody have one that you can kind of tell this person anything and how you're feeling? Well, I do. And his name's Kyle. And I reached out to Kyle because more than I was frustrated as a victim, when I was vulnerable, when I was at my house, I was scared. I was scared more than anything. I lost my confidence. I lost my mojo. I lost my spark. I was three steps ahead and now I'm five steps behind. I didn't want to do anything. I was out of place. I told Kyle that. He told me, do a 48 hour fast. I said, what? You're trying to kill me. I just got out of the hospital. You want me to do a what? Do a 48 hour fast. I did a 48 hour fast and I never, never looked back. Over time, my awareness, it was abundance. Clarity was through the roof. I was in a bubble for so long, and now all of a sudden I'm like, I have peripheral vision of everything. I feel three steps ahead. I'm the type of guy that's like, well, why? Why after month after month of doing this, is this working? I'm in the fitness industry. That's my gig. That's what I know. Why is this happening? I don't get it. Let's forget about bulletproofing your immune system. Let's forget about cellular rejuvenation. Let's forget about living longer, fat loss. Let's talk about something. Why was my cognitive aspects of things different? And it's because of neuron transmitters. I'm not gonna bore you on this. But neuron transmitters, think about it. it sounds like it stems from the brain, but it doesn't. They stem from the gut. That's where they start. Neuron transmitters are communication signals that stem from the gut and they go to the brain. From there, the muscles to the heart. The faster the signal, the better you perform. And I'm not talking about just in the weight room. I'm talking about in life, being vulnerable, not caring, thriving more than striving, seeing things that you haven't seen before. It's crazy. When we... When we eat, we're not really hungry, all right? We're just emotional. And it's cool, like those aren't my rules. Once again, don't look at me like you wanna kick my ass. Like I eat cause I'm sad too, okay? I am still up in this piece. You know what I mean? I did not come from the place where you looked at things always in the positive perception. But now it's a lot more easy than, I, than it once was. When you give your gut a break, there's magic that happens. Your stomach wasn't supposed to digest all day long. There's, there's something called, and I don't want to make this too complicated, but digestive enzymes. These digestive enzymes aid in cellular rejuvenation, but most importantly, they aid in those neuron transmitters. You want a healthy neuron transmitter? Start from your stomach. <clears throat> I finished the previous sentence and I said, you're not really hungry, you're just emotional, right? Me too. When we do decide to eat, 
guess what? It's doing nothing for your body right then and there. Nothing. The only thing it's doing is set, satisfying your brain very temporarily. Because the gut has to now digest. And to do that, it has to work extremely hard. There's a lot of energy put forth in the digesting food. And guess what? When it finally does digest, you know what it pulls first and foremost? It doesn't pull the macros, the carbs, the proteins, the fat that you hear everybody talking about. You better balance those out. You know, you know what it pulls out? The micronutrients first and foremost. And that's what you guys are drinking. That's the juice. An abundance of micronutrients. It was formulated to make the fast just a more enjoyable experience. I could talk about fasting. I could talk about micronutrients for a long time. My job and my mission is introduced somebody that saved my life. Back there, his name's Kyle, and he's, he's my best bud, all right? He's taught me a lot of different things. I'm super excited for you guys to get to know Kyle, but I'm really excited for Kyle to get to know you guys. Because if you guys give this, him 35 days, his five week panda challenge, he's gonna change your whole situation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna present to you my best bud, Kyle Newell, AKA the Panda Man. You're the man. <laughs> it's the truth, brother. Thank you, bro. All right, guys, what's up? So, I'm Kyle. As BK was saying, we go way back. He did a great job breaking down a lot of the fasting, so I'm gonna give you a little bit more on that. And fasting, guys, is really like the ultimate self-development tool. So I'll give you the story of when I came upon fasting. It was 2014. So this is me in 2014. This was me in 2012. I was playing in a men's league basketball game at the time. I had my training facility, my gym, and I was also a full-time teacher, phys ed teacher. Coming off a real bad case of pneumonia. Probably shouldn't have been playing, but I was feeling better. It was two weeks after I came off of it. I was running down the court. My left leg just explodes. Gruesome injury. Patella tendon snapped into four pieces, IT band, three ligaments tore, knee capsule blew out. Bad. You can see I'm like... They have my, one of my teammates there has a phone, that's my wife on the phone. And I, I just knew it was bad. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I'm like, this is bad, whatever. And my whole life, right, phys ed teacher, owning the gym, was based on physicality. That, and there was nothing out there on this injury. Like, it wasn't like an ACL where you could get ready information. There was nothing. And I was getting scared that I wasn't gonna have full use of my knee. So, Fast forward like five, six months, four months in, I only had 72 degrees range of motion. Come on in. Yeah, no problem, come on in. Check their IDs. Check their IDs at the door. How you doing? Hi. Good morning. So with that injury, yeah, you got seats over there. You go sit if you want, okay. Not knowing if I was going to have full use of my leg, right? The doctor's telling me that. Couldn't bend it. Four months in, very little bend. At that point, I made the commitment. I said, you know, I'm going to compete again in a bodybuilding. I had done, to that point, I had done five shows. Hadn't competed in a number of years. Competed successfully, but it was within getting ready for that contest. I'm always researching stuff. So I'm reading something about eight weeks out from my show, basically starving myself at that point. 15, 1,600 calories a day, and I'm a pretty big guy. That's not a lot of food, but that's the only way I could get lean. I damaged my metabolism so much throughout the years trying to get lean, just starving myself. We've all done, done that with diets, right? So I'm reading this book, and I'm talking about stubborn fat cells. So for women, that's typically your glutes and your thighs. For men, that's usually your, your abdomen, your love handles. It could flip, but that's 95% of the time where your stubborn fat is. And if you touch your stubborn fat, hand to skin, it's colder than the rest of your body. The reason it is stubborn, those receptors have a very poor blood supply. So the fat, first step in fat loss is mobilization. You have to be able to get blood in there 
to transport it out, to utilize it as energy. So I'm reading this author, you know, this guy used to study a lot with nutrition, and he says the only way to increase blood flow to those areas is through fasting. That's it. So the next day I switched to fasting. What most people know is intermittent fasting, a 16 hour fast. Everything was controlled, tracking my food, right? Weighing everything, so I had a lot of good data. But right away I was like, this is a lot simpler than what I was doing. I went from eating four meals a day to two meals a day. Hunger right away was much more manageable. So as Brandon was saying, hunger is really an emotion. We're gonna go over that more. But that was how I started fasting, that was 2014. Fast forward to 2019, after doing that for five years, you know, 16 to 20 hour fast, doing a fat loss contest at the gym with my, my employees, my staff, and I said, I gotta dive back into this. I wanna be able to compete with these younger coaches, try to beat them in this fat loss contest, and that's when I started researching longer form fasting, 48s, 72s, 96s, and what happens? You know, what happens to the body when you do that? So what, at the time, right, it's becoming more popular now, but there, there wasn't that much out there on it. A lot of people weren't willing to go at night without eating food. Now, interesting thing about this, talk about mindset, did the show about four months after that contest, I did the same exact thing to my right leg. Same exact injury, but I had a different mindset. I'd already written a book on the topic and just having that reframe like Brandon was talking about, I knew that it was gonna allow me to help more people. Right, so I believe it happened to me for a reason, but snuck a contest in there and blew the other knee out. Tonight, a couple foundations, shattering your perceptions of what you think you know about food and how it works. Fasting is the abstinence, the way I define it, from food. Calories. That's the main thing. Me and Brandon were talking earlier. He was saying when he go gets his, his coffee at McDonald's in the morning, just the smell can spike insulin. Just thinking about food can spike insulin. You're not fasting necessarily from insulin. We're gonna go over insulin a little bit more because that's the whole driver of this as far as your physiology. So what we're concerned about is you're not putting any calories, very minimal, in your mouth when you're fasting. Body fat, even the leanest person in this room, which is probably Brandon, guarantee you he can go 30 days without eating. Not that he would want to, but he has enough fuel on his body in terms of body fat, so body fat is food. That's the main reason we have body fat. So you have to reframe that. If you wanna use this, you gotta let your body use that as a food source. The world record for fasting that's on record is 382 days. A man went over a year without eating. This is a guy from uh, Scotland. Reversed every disease he had. Lost over 200, it was in the 60s. Lost over 200 pounds. Water, and he was, you know, he'd take some vitamins, that was it, yeah. Food is a drug, guys. Food affects, it is, it is. It's a, it, once you realize that, you, you reframe it. It affects the internal biochemical hormonal environment of your body. That's the definition of a drug. The reason Brandon was saying, right, when you get emotional, you want it, most people turn to food, it makes you feel better temporarily. But it's a drug. Now, it's meant to be enjoyed as well. So selfishly, when I created the Panda Diet, it was all from stuff I struggle with with nutrition, being a bodybuilder, body image stuff, these calorie controlled meals, being miserable, walking around with Tupperware, weighing my food, starving myself all the time. I love to eat. I probably have the biggest appetite of anybody in this room. I can almost guarantee you that. But I was not able to satisfy that. Now, every night when I eat, it's a blessing, it's a feast. So that was another thing, right? Your definition of success with your mind it needs clarity, it needs definitions. So if you're gonna do something like the Panda Challenge or anything in your life, figure out what does success mean to you? Most people, the default for success, right, is I gotta make more money. Well, what if you make more money and you're miserable? What if you lose 40, 50 pounds and your energy's terrible? Is that success? You gotta think about this. Come up with bullet points for this. That way you have clarity. If the brain doesn't have clarity, it goes into freeze mode. You won't take action. Freeze mode is one of the stress responses most people don't talk about. They talk about fight or flight. Freeze mode is the one that affects us most. And then you're five, six, seven. So I have a picture of my family here, three kids and Devin. A lot of what I do with the five, six, seven, and I'll explain that in a second, is based around them. The legacy I'm gonna leave behind for my kids and the patterns 
that they're going to see me complete or not complete. So I know if I don't do what I said I would do, if I leave them with weak patterns, guess what? The kids mimic that. It doesn't matter what I say. And that's painful for me to think about. As soon as I start thinking about, well, I want to do this, I want to get this, it's like that's not a powerful driver. Pain is what drives you. When you do a five, six, seven, and this is something I would take you through in the Panda Challenge, you say, okay, what's your goal? Let's say it's weight loss. I want to lose 20 pounds. That's not really what you're after. I would ask you six more times, why? Well, it's going to give me more energy. Why do you want more energy? I'm going to be able to do more. Why do you want to do more? And you keep going down. Once you get to that, those deeper reasons, and most people never think beyond number two. Once you get to those deeper reasons, your fifth, sixth, and seventh answer, that's, that's your intention. That's, that's your inspiration. And that's super important because, as Brandon was saying, when stress hits, that's always going to be the thing that throws you off track. We've all tried diets before. And you start out with the best of intentions. And then you hit a roadblock. You get stressed. You get burnt out from it. Ah, you know, I'm comfortable. It doesn't matter. I can stay here. I don't have to lose that 20 pounds. Because losing weight is what I call in fitness is a quadrant two activity. It's important, but it's not urgent for most people. So with habits, it's about three letters. Attention, intention, and repetitions. Okay? You have to put your attention on your intentions. That's your five, six, seven. This stuff is foundational if you're going to make a transformation. Temporary change is easy. Anybody can get you to lose quick weight. But as we know, most people put it right back on. And then some. Misconceptions and common enemies. Now, one of the biggest enemies you're going to have if you take on this fasting-focused lifestyle is other people. Subconsciously, right, they don't realize that they're fearful of this. So what are they going to try? They're going to try to say, you're going to, these are some of the things, right? You're going to go into starvation mode. I hear that all the time from doctors and everything. Do I look like I'm in starvation mode? I eat on average less than six meals a week throughout the year, right? So starvation mode, let me explain this. When you cut calories like most diets, you cut out food groups, your metabolic rate is gonna lower to match what you're putting in. Now your metabolic rate, we're gonna come back to on the high end in a little bit, can upregulate or downregulate 40%. Most of us, like when I was competing for bodybuilding, experience it coming down. 2,000 calories up, my body matches that now. Cut it to 1,600, body comes down, matches it. There's only so far you can cut. Meanwhile, while you're doing that on a traditional North American diet, your main hunger hormone, something called ghrelin, is going up, 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 up. Metabolic rate's down, hunger hormones are up. Eventually, I don't care how much discipline you have, you're gonna break, you can't sustain that. Now you go back to even eating your regular amount of food from prior, but metabolic rate's down here, Fat storing enzymes are up. Hunger hormones are through the roof. Guess what? You pack on a lot more fat. You start out heavier than when you began. And this is like, if you look at Oprah, that's what she's done throughout the years. This is what happened to me when I was competing. I would train my body to store fat. And I'd get ripped, and then three, four days later, I'd be 40 pounds heavier after a show. And I couldn't get full. So starvation mode happens when you do a traditional calorie cutting diet. When you fast, metabolic rate goes up, Hunger hormones go down. And I'm not, I'm not talking about a 16-hour fast. 16-hour fast isn't going to do much for you guys. You got to get into that one meal, uh, one meal a day type of cadence. And when you feast like I teach, like we teach, you can push that metabolic rate up. Go up 40%. How do you do that? By eating more. So you got to train your appetite. Muscle loss. People are going to say you're going to lose muscle doing this. Fasting is very good at preserving muscle and setting up the internal environment of your body to put on muscle. You're going to be more insulin sensitive. So when you eat, especially if you're training like at a place like Christian's place, those calories when you eat are much more likely, those micronutrients, to go to the muscle cell rather than the fat cell. Growth hormone, when you start getting into the longer fasting, is spiked two to 3,000% every day. Growth hormone is great for brain function, fat loss, and preserving muscle. Luteinizing hormone, that's a precursor for testosterone goes up when you get into longer fasting, up to 67%. So all these things optimize. So you're not going to lose muscle when you fast. Frequent feedings. You're going to hear this, that you got to eat frequently to boost your metabolic rate. That's not true at all. Most of the stuff you've heard about nutrition, regular nutrition, is completely the opposite. When you eat often and you start getting hungry for that next meal, most people misinterpret that as, my metabolism's going, I'm hungry again. It's because you're messing with the hunger hormone. You have something called food entrainment patterns. When you've trained your body to expect food, 
let's say it was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Guess what time you're going to get hungry when you first start this? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You've trained your body to do that, but it goes away over time. You don't need to eat frequently to spike metabolic rate. And again, spiking metabolic rate is way overrated. We just don't want to crash it. We don't want to damage it. Breakfast is not the most important meal of the day. When you break your fast is the most important meal of the day. Look at the word, break it down, break fast. This is marketing. This is a trillion dollar industry. Look at who funds these studies that tell you this stuff. Look what the universities teach you guys or teach people that are out there. And most people in fitness, Christian will tell you, Brandon will tell you, I call them fake fitness experts because all they do is repeat what has been out there. A lot of people like on social media, a lot of these fitness guys will say, this doesn't work. Have you tried it? No. Then how can they speak about it intelligent? They're just going based on what they read in the book. So breakfast, and breakfast as we know it is, is relatively recent in, in the span of human history, the past 150 years or so. But for sickly people and people more in, in, in Europe about 150 years ago, when they, they didn't get lunch breaks, they didn't know when they were going to get to eat. So what would they do? They would eat before they went in to, to work the fields. Breakfast, right? Most models of weight loss are based in the simultaneous model. Cut calories, burn calories, you should lose weight. It's a math equation people tell you, it's not. If you make it right, so a pound of fat, we know if you just look at calories, that's 3,500 calories. So if you create a deficit of 500 calories a day, you should lose a pound of fat a week. So in a year, you should be down 52 pounds of fat. That doesn't sound that hard to do, but it doesn't work. It's what happens with your metabolism, all this type of stuff, right? It's not about the calories at all. It's about the hormones. How you actually lose weight is called a sequential model. I'll go over that in a little bit. Okay, it's a sequential model. It doesn't work by cutting calories, all that stuff. I've tried it. I've tracked everything. I've tried everything out there that there is. Why have we been told this? Follow the money. Who's putting out these studies? Lack of expertise. There's a huge lack of real expertise when it comes to nutrition. Everybody's just repeating stuff, as I told you. And it passes the buck. When I first started my gym, I would put people, okay, I want to lose 20 pounds. Okay, how much do you weigh? Okay, I'll figure out the calories. Give them how many ounces of everything. How many grams? And it would work maybe like one out of 15 people, temporarily. But me, I didn't know what else to do. So but they must be lying to me. They're not following it. They're not doing something right. It's easy for the doctor or the fitness professional to say, oh, it's them. It's not my plan. So how do Panda works? Not based on a caloric deficit. You don't have to track food at all. Again, I hated doing that. I created this selfishly, like I told you. The only time I'll track food is out of experiments. That's it. See how much I can eat. See if I can break that 10,000 calorie mark. Right? That's the only reason. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about your macronutrients, as Brandon said. You don't have to cut your carbs. None of this silliness. Most people, right, when they go on low-carb diets, why are they doing that? They think they're managing insulin. Not realizing that eating animal protein disproportionately spikes insulin. The fasting cleans up the insulin problem. Hormones. So insulin, you've heard me talk about that a few times. That's the only hormone that we can really control. When you eat, that's the main time it's produced by the pancreas. It's released. Blood sugar goes up when you eat. Insulin's released. Okay, let's bring that blood sugar back down by clearing these nutrients, putting them into the fat cell or the muscle cell. Now, over time, we become insulin resistant. You become resistant to the effects of insulin. So now your body's got to produce a little bit more to clear the same amount of food. Then it's got to produce a little bit more. Stress, lack of sleep, all this stuff, eating the wrong foods, eating too frequently, is going to make you insulin resistant. And by the way, every disease known to mankind, the root cause of it is insulin resistance. So the panda, we control insulin. We're only having a spike when you have your feast. At that time, you want to take advantage of the anabolic effect of insulin. I get a lot of these fitness guys again online will say, oh, I don't want to eat fruit first. It's going to spike insulin. First of all, fruit rarely spikes insulin. Secondly, when you eat, you want to take advantage of the anabolic effect of insulin. You want it to spike. You want to drive that stuff into the muscle cell. You're not trying to limit it when you eat. That's stupid. You can't do that. It doesn't make any sense. Growth hormone, I told you, is going to spike. Now, this has a compounding effect. If you do this day after day, week after week, month after month, it just keeps working more and more. Your skin's going to get thinner. 
you're going to be leaders. So the first summer I, I created the Panda, 2019, so four and a half years ago now, started that April, I was 250 pounds. And I wasn't, I wasn't obese or anything like that. Body fat was 15, 16%, but I didn't feel good. I was just too big. Went down to 225 that first summer. The whole first summer, I did 72-hour fast every week to get the data. Went down to 225. Today, about 225. Weight's exactly the same, without trying, but I'm much leaner than I was that first summer. It compounds, it keeps working. You're, hit, you're playing with those hormones positively every single day. Glucagon, another important one, guys. Insulin keeps your blood sugar from going too high. Glucagon keeps it from going too low. One of the concerns we always get with fasting in the Panda is I'm gonna get hypoglycemia, I'm gonna get blood sugar crashes. Very, very rare to actually have a true hypoglycemic. Very rare. Well, I get shaky. What is that? That's withdrawal from the drug of food. That's exactly what it is. If you, I guarantee you, if you start this, first of all, the withdrawal symptoms, mild headaches, stuff like that, they go away quickly. I've done this now 20 different times the Panda Challenge. The most I've seen symptoms last from withdrawal is about two days. It's not like other drugs. It clears pretty quick, these withdrawal symptoms. And if you don't believe me, if you think you're getting low blood sugar, if you start this, get a glucometer. You can buy one at Walgreens or CVS. You feel like you're getting low blood sugar, take your blood sugar, see where it's at. I guarantee you it's within the healthy range or it's on the high side. Glucagon is gonna keep it from going too low. Now with fat loss, glucagon has to be elevated. You cannot lose fat if glucagon is not elevated. Even if you're in a deficit, eating frequently, you're spiking insulin. If you're spiking insulin, you cannot lose weight. Insulin tells your body to store and to hold on to. These two oppose each other. Insulin's up, glucagon is down. Glucagon can only be up when insulin's flatlined. And cortisol. So cortisol gets a bad rap sometimes. It's a stress hormone. It's only a bad rap if, if we're chronically overstressed, lack of sleep, doing just things that not managing our mindset and stuff like that. The most stressful time of the day for the human body is when you wake up. You're going from a sleeping state to a waking state. The main hormone that should be peaking at that time is cortisol. If you go back to how we came up, how we evolved over the past couple thousand years. You weren't in these safe homes in a comfortable bed. You might have been out there with your tribe or your pack. You had to wake up, gather your, your surroundings. Where am I getting food? Is everybody safe? How am I going to protect us? Where are the enemies? Cortisol made you more alert. You want that to rise throughout the first part of the day. When we eat a traditional breakfast, insulin goes up. There's something called a fishing effect. Insulin goes up, cortisol comes back down. And growth hormone can only rise along with cortisol. So if you just look at the hormones, you know that some type of fasting is the correct thing to do for the human body hormonally. You want cortisol to rise. You eat breakfast, traditional breakfast, it's not happening. Detox. All of our toxins are stored in our fat cells. Which goes into the point too, as an aside, when you're eating animal products, animal meat, check where that food came from. Try to get grass fed, cage free organic if you can because just like us those animals store toxins in their fat cells if you're getting the cheapest ground beef you can get you're eating that and it's pumped full of antibiotics and all these things guess where those toxins are going into your fat cells when you eat them when you first start you might get flu-like symptoms your body is releasing toxins insulin's going to open up those cells stuff's going to come into your bloodstream i've had that happen to many clients goes away quickly The meaning of panda, so the black or white of an actual panda. Part of the symbology of why I chose that. It's black or white. Willpower, if we look at habits and mind mapping, you are not gonna form habits uh, around anything that's purely willpower based. Willpower is very finite. By the end of the day, it's burned up. It's in the frontal cortex of your brain. You had a long day, you had a stressful day, you had all this other stuff, willpower's gone. That's why a lot of people have the best of intentions. Guess what, they get home from work, Dealing with the kids, whatever, and they go for the cookies. Oh, I set out, I didn't want to do that. It doesn't matter, you're, you're using willpower. You need a little bit of willpower to begin, and then once you get on, get it going, it's not gonna, you don't need it. But with the panda, taking the mind mapping science into, into consideration, like it was all formed with the mind mapping, how do we form habits? That's the main goal that I have for you. How do you form habits? The main goal Krishna has for you, how do you form habits and break down bad habits? It's black or white, you're either fasting or you're feasting. 
There's no, let me see how I feel. You eliminate the gray area. If you take that off the table, it gets very simple. Because when I feel that hunger spike for one minute and it lasts very short, the hunger pan, it's not even an option for me to eat. I've taken it off the table. So then what? Now I've got to go in, okay, what, what's my mindset? What is the dialogue that's going on in my head? That's why fasting is the ultimate self-development tool. You've got to start mastering your inner dialogue. There's no gray areas. The word decision, I use that a lot with the panda, that's based on a Latin word, which means to sever, to cut yourself off from any other possibility. Once you decide too fast, that's it. It's very simple. It's going to give you so much more headspace. So this, the fridge and the freezer analogy, this is a sequential model of weight loss. Picture we're in uh, uh, Christian's house. That's the kitchen up there. He's got a freezer upstairs. This is the basement. He's got a freezer down here. The freezer down here represents the body fat that you want to tap into. If that freezer up there is full, you have no reason to come down here into this freezer. The body, it doesn't make sense. You have to empty out that freezer. How do we do that? Going longer periods without eating. So what, in that freezer, there's something called muscle glycogen. So the food in that freezer represents glycogen. You have glycogen in your liver and in your muscles. It's, a quick, it's basically when carbohydrate and water combine. It's a quick energy source. Now to get glucagon up and to lose fat, we have to start lowering these levels and always be on the cusp of having low glycogen stores. So then the body will start tapping into protein. I'm not talking about your muscles. I'm talking about things like loose skin or skin issues, growths within your body, all this stuff. And then it starts tapping into body fat. So you empty that freezer upstairs, which takes a little bit of time when you begin. Now you start tapping into this freezer. And also that freezer in the main level, think of every time you open that door, that light that goes on represents insulin spike. You don't want to see that light that often. So you open that freezer, take as much as you can, shut the freezer till the next day. That's how this works. It's a sequential model. It's not simultaneous, not cut calories, burn calories. So here's how I recommend, okay? And I, I brought books for you guys, okay, if you don't have one. It's all in the book, right? If you decide to go on this on your own, and this is how I would start you as well in the Panda Challenge, I start with the black version of the Panda. You start with a 48 hour fast. The reason I do that is to build your confidence and to knock out any fear that you have. I find when you start doing like a 16, when you start from that end, you start with a low, lower level fast, it doesn't have the same effect. You jump right in. Now me and Brandon were talking on the way up. Think about like a traditional diet. Okay, I wanna lose some weight. Now before you lose that first five pounds, it's gonna take some time, right? And that's the payoff. You might get excited, it might take you a couple weeks. This is completely different than any other way of eating because when you do that first 48, all of a sudden you did something and you feel this sense of accomplishment. It doesn't matter what happened on the scale yet, but you realize, man, I can control this. I'm no longer a slave to what I'm going to eat. And it's a complete mindset shift, complete mindset shift. So you would start with a 48 hour fast and you go to one meal a day. This sounds way harder than it is. Give it a week, you adjust, and then you're off to the races. Within this too, like I take, take the clients through in the Panda Challenge, again, I built everything in here that I always found that worked for me and elements I liked, eliminate everything else. You could have a cheat day. You could have a cheat meal. You're going to find over time you don't want to do a full cheat day because you don't feel as good when you eat throughout the day. But psychologically, it's there if you need it. If you go on vacation, all this stuff, then take a break from it. Your body responds very quickly when you come back to fasting. If you were dieting, you went on vacation, went off, you're done. You come back and everything's gone. And then we explore and experiment, okay, as we go along. So a lot of the clients I have in the, in the Panda Challenge, all of a sudden, I'll throw a challenge out every week after the first week. All of a sudden, amongst themselves, they start trying a 72. They start doing 248s. You use that time to explore and experiment and see what works for you. And then you find your baseline by the end of it. Okay, this is the plan I want to follow. And the success rate is off the charts. I have over 90% success rate with keeping the weight off the clients that go through this. That's stick with it. If you go back to eating three, four, five times a day, guess what's going to happen? Build up the insulin resistance again. The juice. So Brandon made this brilliant concoction because a lot of people don't like this, right? The way this tastes. So, 
Some people get used to it, right? But let me explain why. Yeah, the cold helps. So Brandon put all this stuff in the juice and he made it with stevia, monk fruit extract. So healthy sweeteners, okay? But if you're looking at sodium, sodium, potassium, these are your main two electrolytes in the body. There's other ones, but those are the main two. Every cell in your body has a sodium potassium pump, constantly exchanging these two nutrients. That makes up the biggest part of your metabolic rate. So if you're low in sodium, potassium's too low, your energy's gonna be way lower than it should be. Metabolic rate's gonna be pushed down kind of artificially, because we've been told, like most, most things in nutrition, again, it's wrong, keep your sodium low. Now, water follows sodium. And I'm telling you that because when you first start something like the juice, you might retain water for the first few days. It's pulling more water into the body. Then your body adjusts and it starts flushing it out. Now, sodium within the body too, great for brain function. Sodium chloride, think of that name, chloride. Hydrochloric acid is one of your main digestive enzymes. It's a precursor for digestive enzymes. Helps with making you more insulin sensitive. And if performance is your main issue, sodium, can increase strength endurance by up to 20%. It's off the charts. It's unbelievable what it can do for you. Baking soda, okay, can make the body more alkaline. So you're not gonna change the pH of your body. People confuse alkalinity, acidity, and pH. They're related, but you're not gonna change the pH of your body. But you could change if it's more acidic or more alkaline. Baking soda too is something I use, great for kidney function great for kidney function. So if you look at like what to eat, here we go. I'll go over animal protein in a second. Fruit first. So a lot of people have that as dessert, right? So we flip it, we put it first. It's digested further down in the intestines than most other foods. You wanna get it through the system first. If you eat fruit, heavy fruit after a meal, the other meal is still being digested. The fruit is going to ferment, possibly cause some repeating, indigestion, that type of thing. Now, well, I mentioned that, indigestion. I've had buddies go through this. I have one of the guys highlighted in the book. A lot of times you're forgetting acid reflux. It's not too much acid, it's too little stomach acid. And what happens, your body can't break down the food, it ferments, gas starts coming back up, the sphincter up here, the esophagus opens up, some of the food comes up. Oh, you have too much acid, what do they do? Put you on a PPI, proton pump inhibitor inhibit the little acid you have even further. It's just gonna compound, it's gonna cause a mess. Completely reverse this, you can see in the book, again, the story of my one friend Jabba, his, his endo, uh, gastroenterologist couldn't believe the difference that he had in two, three months. Ulcers gone, inflammation gone. The doctor didn't even know he stopped taking the medicine. He was just following this, okay? So anyway, you wanna get fruit in first, micronutrients, that's the main thing we care about when you eat. Fruit is the best food you can eat. By far. Everybody loves protein. Think about protein, guys. It's dead flesh. I love eating a burger or a steak, too. I grew up like that. But it's what micronutrients are actually in there. Very little. And it makes your body more acidic. Think of the word amino acid. That's what makes up proteins. Makes the body more acidic. Very hard to digest. So just be mindful of that. We want micronutrients. So fruit first. In your stomach has stretch receptors. As soon as that fruit goes in, it has a lot of volume. Starts hitting those stretch receptors. Your brain starts getting a signal that Okay, I've got stuff coming in. Because a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to binge. I'm going to go crazy when I eat when I fast. You cannot overeat with what I'm teaching. You can't do it. I've tried. You might feel like it some nights, especially when you first start learning. It's, oh, I'm stuffed. It's fine. Your body takes what it needs, discards the rest. Main meal, did it come from the ground? And this is 90%. If you're going out with your friends, you want to have a burger and fries and a beer, you do that. It's all built to make your life better, not to take away everything you like. Did it come from the ground? It means all these carb sources, right, are fair game. Potatoes, great. Potatoes are a superfood, any type of potato. The most satiating food there is, is potatoes. Rice, veggies, whatever you like. Make it tasty. And then you could put your animal protein here as well. You see in the book, I have, in that, I said, okay, maybe three days a week, have animal protein. And that's purely for health reasons. You know, I come from a background of eating three to 400 grams of protein a day when I was competing. So I just keep an open mind with this stuff. I do the research. I look at 
what we have to do to make the body healthier. If you want to have it every day, fine. You're already limiting the impact of it by the fact that you're fasting and you're not eating. You do not have to eat your body weight in grams of protein. That's complete nonsense. It is more anabolic. If you want to get more muscle, we increase it slightly. You don't have to go crazy with your tail. But that's where you would put your protein. In an example of a dessert, like what I do on a typical night, make some soaked oats, put some milk in there, almond milk or raw milk, cinnamon, stevia, put it in the fridge, let it sit half a day or overnight, take it out when it's time to eat it. Now put some frozen blueberries. I'm not, it's not too many of them. Put them in there as a base. Almond butter, some nuts, delicious. So you have it, if you're, like if you're still hungry after you eat, have something ready. If you're still hungry after that, you didn't eat enough. Like you gotta, you gotta get this concept of the feast into your head. When people say, how long should it be? Look, 90 minutes tops, you should be done. But I don't want you stressing it. But it's not meant to be like a four hour window where you're just eating the whole time. Feast and be full. And by the way, the, the meal that I recommend is dinner. The best time of the day for the human body to eat is around lunchtime. But if you look at habits, you look at social patterns of people, dinner is usually the staple. That's why we do it at dinner. You can do it at breakfast if you wanted to. It won't have quite the same impact. Lunch is the best if you look at far as physiology. Highest success rate is going to be dinner. Biofeedback. So you guys would have the scale to go off. Scale, pictures, waist measurements, that's external feedback, which is good. We take that into consideration. The way I would adjust you is taking that in the Panda Challenge. What are your metrics telling me? And what is this stuff telling me? Any changes in any of these things? If you're dropping weight and your energy is tanking, we're doing something wrong. We've got to fix that. If the scale hasn't changed yet, but all this stuff is improving, we're on the right track. It's going to happen. Too many people ignore this stuff. Your body's speaking to you all the time. It's called biofeedback. That's what a coach should assess. Just like with training, right? If you're doing something that looks great on paper, but your joints kill you every time afterwards, it's not the right thing for you. All right, before I go over how to get into the Panda Challenge, what questions do you guys have? Any questions based upon, for, yeah. What was that? I'm sorry. You had the micronutrients and then the, the oats at night. When do you do that? After fasting or during fasting? No, that's your meal. That's your meal. That's when you break your fast. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. so that's your meal. That's when you break it. Yeah, so that's break upon breaking. Okay. If you're fasting, can you do any specific activity? Oh, yeah. Good question. So the juice, right? So when people... There is right, that fear factor when you first start fasting that your performance is gonna tank. When you first start, you go that first day, it might come down a little bit, right? But once you get into it, performance is actually gonna improve because blood flow and therefore oxygen to the working muscles and the mitochondria is gonna in improve and increase. Performance should actually go up. And you start getting into that four or five day fast, you still wanna be active. You might just tailor it different. It might be a weighted vest walk. Right, it might be something along those lines. But I've, again, I've tested this on myself. I've had ultra endurance athletes go through this where they're running 50, 60 miles a week, doing 100 mile races, and they're fine. It's a good we were question. Talking on the way, uh, it's a great question. That's why I came up here. We were talking on the way up here. Um, we knew somebody, we were designing this in March of 2020. Um, we, this whole concept with the juice and, and all this, it's taken us a minute to come to fruition, but uh, somebody was talking to us about fasting and he said he was going to do a 48 hour fast, but he was going to, you know, shut the blinds. He's going to stay on the couch, just chill, read a book, you know, sleep. And me and Kyle and myself, we kind of were like, what, like, are you going to tell him or am I going to tell him? Like, you, you're not wasting it, but you have the best source of energy right then and there to be able to utilize for your benefit. You don't want to hide from that. Um, I'm not sure if you train or if you once did train, but on my first 72 hour fast at the 68 minute mark, I took second in a pretty big jujitsu tournament. Um, 68 hours, nothing other than we didn't have that yet. We just had the traditional juice, um, coffee, and I was experimenting. I was like, am I, you know, am I going to die? You know, you have these internal fights. We call them dragons, you know, but... What I've learned through Kyle is 
You don't fight the dragons, you get to learn them because they're not going anywhere. You start to learn those dragons and what kind of excels you, which part of them, because if you know the brain, how Kyle's gonna teach you, they can work in unison together like a symphony of instruments as opposed to just one single one that over dominates everything else. So for me, when I fast, I want to do things. I want to write a book. I want to write programs. Whatever it is, I'm going to utilize it for the best of my ability. That helps you out. Follow-up Yeah. Have you fasted 72 hours before competition? During. At the 68-minute mark was my, or 68-hour mark was my final uh, match. So that was my championship match. I did lose that match, but I had energy like a Spartan. I was a savage out there. It was like a fight or flight. It was a, in my mind, now remember, perception's reality. In my mind, it was giving me this primal energy that, I, that it just came out of, not nowhere, but it's just like magic. It's inside of you. You'll feel that, at least for myself and a lot of my clients, they feel an, a surge of energy. So we don't want to waste that, you know, um, if that helps out. Yeah, you know, I mean, don't hide from it. Don't do nothing, you know. Yeah. What was what was the question? Like prepping for a long fast. If you were going to prep before I mean, fast before competition, did you try with it? So for myself, I I did not. I always train fasted. That's since. I've been with Kyle on this fasting journey. I always train fasted. Every time I have some sort of calories, I feel um, heavier. I don't feel as in shape. So I'm pretty used to always training fast. And now going a long time like that, that was different for me. That was, and it was more of my mind. Um, the perception was, is it, was, it wasn't kill or be killed. I don't want to scare anybody out there, but it is a competition. So um, it just helped me. My last fast, it was a 100-hour fast. I did it on like um, a makeshift nachos with cheese Whiz on there. And I say this because you don't have to have the perfect meal to go into a fast. I used to think that. I used to tell me to fast on Sundays to long on Mondays. I used to have to have the perfect salmon and, and rice and you know everything so perfect. And it's like, man, your body has enough nutrients to last, in theory, 10 to 15 days. Jesus Christ did 40 days in four different books, and that guy did, I don't know how many, 300 yeah, something. Yeah. But in, in theory, like, and that's just doctors knowing that you have nutrients in your body stored up. It's just tapping into it. And then being able to reframe the situation. You know, I don't wanna over- No, it's great. Oversee this, but uh, it, it helped me, you know. What else you guys got? I do a lot of um, cycling. I do like uh, long distance and stuff, 50 miles, 100 miles, or even more, 100 miles. Um, the one time I was fasting for like 17 hours, maybe. And that did uh, 50 mile rides. Um, I felt strong. Yeah. I did the hunger. You're gonna, yeah, remember, the hunger is going to be there, but hunger is um, more of an emotion. Yeah. Surprise yourself. At this point, so. Absolutely. We were almost brought up to, you know, you always have to eat like breakfast and lunch. Don't forget about this. You're going to be drowsy. You're going to be lethargic. It's like, man, it's the exact opposite. You know, tap into what you already have, but you have to give your body that chance. If you don't give your body the chance, it's going to do the same routine that it's always doing. Give that body the chance and watch what happens. That's, you know, you are in control. Just to add, like, all these questions that were repeating, and this question, I did, I think it was like three weeks with the three day fasting, and then my last fourth week I did a five fast. And uh, just for his question, off on my third day, I was still dealing with 315. Nice. Uh, in the morning, my mouth felt a little dry, but um, once I got Yeah. Like he said, I was surprised and I was still doing it. And I just sat there and I'm like, okay, three days, no water, no food, and I can still do 
you know, like Brian just said, your perception is different than and what's then, possible. You know, like Christian always like, once he told me like food is addicting, you start thinking about that, like you guys are saying, and it changes everything you look at. You just think, I could do this, I've done it, and you just go. You do it, yeah. Yeah. Your body, your body just helps you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little guy. Your yeah, body just helps you, like you're alive. You don't pray the same thing, so it's like you have to fight for it anymore. Yeah. The good stuff, yeah. You know, the, the good stuff. It is, yeah. And yeah, you have the power over the food. Yeah, you have, the you. You have yeah. moments where you want, like, you know, that dessert and all that, but that's that's what this makes you, makes you, like, have that balance of knowing what your body can have and not have at the right time, you know. And that's what I know is doing. Yeah, yeah you. Like, you know, doing three days fasting is yeah. just more energy. I can control what I eat without having to, you know, feel like, oh my God, I want it. Just you don't want to eat when you used to eat. Yeah, I, and yeah. I used noticed, to eat I Ben and Terry's ice cream, <laughs> the plain or the blue, you know, the, every day. She'll tell you, my uncle will tell you, I want <laughs> every <laughs> single <laughs> day. I would, all I grew up on was McDonald's, Chick fil A, Wendy's, all that. And now, I can't even eat it. Yeah, so your body like, this does It literally you. throws it all out. You know, they all know me, Coach knows me now, you know, all the girls. I didn't eat vegetables, I didn't eat yes. I never, I never that. My thing was just, you ate something, go fucking work out. No excuses. But there's a lot of things that, you know, coach brings up, you guys are bringing up that, it changes. And now when you want to eat, like I said, if you're going to five guys, I'll go to mixed prime, you know, and get a burger. No, I'm not saying it's the healthier still, but at least it's the choices better. are better. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. You know, yeah. so, but now it's like, Now you want to eat something, so now you actually sit down and you actually enjoy that meal instead of just, oh, I'm eating. So, Big it time. Does so, very, so it's very true what you guys are saying. Oh, yeah. It yeah. works. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy because I got into it for energy originally. I needed to like get confidence. It was, I stuck with it because of longevity. I started nerding out on the science behind it. There's not a whole lot out there, but cellular rejuvenation, that's a real thing. Your immune system, why it happens, why it becomes a little more predominant. I have cancer on, my, my father died at an early age. And I didn't know I had trauma from it until I started really researching about the longevity of it. Because you know they say if it's in your family. so. I kind of just shifted my mindset for the longevity aspect of it. And it seems to be playing out for the better. It's not about always about that fat loss. You know, it's about those choices. And the more you can make those choices, it seems like it'll just start compounding. I get it all the time when we do these seminars is, when do you give yourself a break? Like, don't you, and for me it's, well, this makes me happy. Yeah, exactly. It makes me feel good. Why would I give myself a break from feeling good? You know, and I just can hope that you guys can allow that body to produce that magic that it has, that it was internally meant for. It's, I mean, we're like the only culture that doesn't fast. One of the only ones. The, it's, yeah, the religions fast. So there's power behind there, for sure. No, These are great questions, thing. Christian. I just want to add on to uh, what the guy was saying. Like, you guys, for me, I went through probably one of the biggest transformations recently. And uh, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, the haircut really helped me out. Uh, I want to say I was about two, 260. Yeah. 
Also, Kyle has a really awesome hat, right? <laughs> Which was a white hat with a purple panda. And I became completely obsessed with reaching that level. He did. I told him I wanted that. He goes, you didn't do the challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't uh, buy it. You can't buy it. Right. Well, he just, so when it, ended, when it ended with a 14 hour walk after going through the fast, Twelve. everyone in the gym was supporting me and they, were, they knew what I was doing. I had to call our, uh, the, the Bridgefield uh, Police Department and tell them, yes. I'm going to be walking around town with a weight vest on. I'm going to be walking And this is a different challenge than the panda yeah. challenge. <laughs> just to let you know, just to let you know as we're closing this up. <laughs> yeah. Probably new limit. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. just like, oh my god, I hit this level. I haven't been there before. Yeah. Body. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just to add to that too, because I have a friend who's hard to manage. I mean, I can run 20 miles to the point like uh, run up a hill and walk like a friend. And sometimes I think this not because of what I eat. Sometimes it's because I think I push myself harder than why I have to push myself. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm convinced that's not the food. Right? No. And if it was, it'd be the lack of the micronutrients, the electrolytes. But a lot of times, it's the acidic buildup. Right? We're not breathing properly. All this type of stuff. We get it. We climb the we climb mountains together, and we cramp like it's. And the people that do eat, they cramp first. I'm just, I'm, I don't, it's crazy. I mean, if, if we look back on it and see the people, it's like, um, we don't know. We're just speculating. You know, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of unknowns with it. But usually when you push your body to the limits, that's a telltale sign. It's, your body speaks to you, like Kyle was saying earlier. That's something that's speaking to you. That's your mindset. Yeah. 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 I cramp almost every day, or used to, um, until I started drinking the juice. Yes. And then I, I definitely, if I miss the juice, I can almost guarantee you when I wake up in the middle of the night, I cramp. So it's definitely those nutrients, oh, yeah. the electrolytes. And it's because the world tells us not to forget about salt, but we need the salt. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Salt of life. Salt to the earth, man. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. never on meds, but I definitely knew I had Gone. Yeah. I had already been checked and diagnosed. I don't have that issue. Awesome. Are you guys excited about uh, the Panda Challenge? You guys want to give it a shot? Anybody? Yeah? Let me tell you guys that. All right. Yeah. Quick question. So when you're fasting, right? When you're fasting, you just have like, just hydrate yourself when you're fasting? Yeah, and I mean, I. Plus coffee. I, I drink black coffee, um, so that sometimes dehydrates you. But it's coffee. That's what I, I you know, that's what I like. And you know, no. Satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. So I got books for you at the end. 
We're going to start this. I talked to Christian October 16th. Here's the deal. If you scan that, it'll take you to a page. Okay. If you just put your information, you're not committing to anything on that page, but I'll reach out to you to see if it's a good fit. If you decide that you want to do this by tomorrow night, you click the button, go to the next page, you get $100 off. It's normally $4.99, it would be $3.99. My guarantee, you're going to get unstuck. You're going to learn more about your mind and the self-awareness and the fasting than 99% of the people on the planet. And you're going to have a tool that you can use forever. People... No. That's the Indigo Challenge. You get a shirt. So, with it, you get a shirt. Okay, and each week I teach you a live lesson. I do that on Zoom. Now... This is, I am open, I haven't done this in probably half a year. So this is open to, it's gonna be open to all my audience on social media. I capped this at 30 people. So if it's full, you're out. We came right. here first for this exact reason, for Christian. Christian is one of clients, uh, Kyle's clients. If you look at that date, five weeks will go right into Thanksgiving. So it's a perfect challenge right before the, it's, the ultimate fat, the break of the fast right there. What if you want to eat? You can tailor it to that. I've had people that are skinny that do it, right? They want more energy. So I wouldn't, that, yeah, I wouldn't think about it just for fat loss. That's He's going to yeah. teach you how to fat loss, but it's a byproduct of really just being able to control your thoughts and be able to navigate yourself through this. Yeah. I tell people diets, never worked. You'll never have to diet again. That should, that should be the slogan right there. You should never have to die it again. Never again. But do us a favor. Take a picture of that because once we open this up after tonight, it's 30 people limited to. We're not just saying that. Um, and this is the first time we're bringing it to this attention of, uh, for you guys. So um, I thank you for your time. I mean, yeah. honestly, like we, we value your time tremendously. And they, how about a uh, round? Yeah. Try the juice, of course. Try the juice. We'll be here if you want to ask us any questions afterwards. I know people got to get going. Scan that, though, um, because I don't want Christian to be trying to make sure that we get people in there. Let's get it now before we start opening this up to everybody else. Hey, guys, real quick. Um, scan that so you have it. Yeah. You understand what it is, right? If you have a question on how much it is, like they said, if you do it by tomorrow night, you, get, you put the code PANDA in, otherwise that's gone and it'll be full price, okay? Here's the kicker, guys. If you're not a member, if you're not a member Panda. here. Panda. Yeah. Guys, so listen up. If you're not a member here, if you are a member here, give the people that are not members here a moment to, to listen. If you're not a member here and you click on that and you join the Panda Challenge, it includes you training here with me three times a week. Killer. Yeah. All right. So that's three times a week that you get to train with me along while following the nutrition with Kyle. Yeah. So, I mean, because one goes with the other. You, just you do your weekly check-ins with Christian as far as your weight, all that stuff. And we, I don't know if you guys took the tour upstairs, but we have the e-ball machine, so we'll scan you and we'll see everything that's going on inside your body, where your body's at, where how much water you're retaining, the whole deal. That way you know where you started and you know where you end. Uh, and if we can see your check-ins on a weekly basis. So it's up to you, but I would take advantage of this amazing office. Yeah, this is my first time to Connecticut. I appreciate you guys. You know, thank you so much. Good job. Thank you, Christian. Thanks, Christian. I got books if you want to hand them out. Okay.